Leviticus chapter 13 was spent with Jehovah through Moses teaching about how to identify Zarat and in all of its many forms. Even Zarat on clothing and objects made from leather. And it was always the job of a priest to make that kind of judgment. A common Israelite could only abide by that priest's decision. Now let's remember that the priest was neither a healer, he wasn't a doctor who made some kind of a medical diagnosis. This was a spiritual diagnosis that was being called for. Sarat was not seen, despite what movies you may have seen, as a biological disease. It was a divine affliction that resulted from some unacceptable spiritual condition. It was a punishment from God. So in essence, the priest was to use a tangible, visible means by which to determine a person's inward, invisible spiritual condition. And naturally, these visible scales and these sores were carefully defined in the categories of clean and unclean according to God's standards because not all skin diseases were Zerat. Just the ones that were called out in Leviticus 13, just the ones that were deemed to indicate that the Metzorah, that was the person who had Zerat, was ritually unclean in Hebrew Tameh. Now, in chapter 14, the rites of purification from uncleanness are introduced and as tedious as Leviticus 13 was with all of these micro details concerning Sarat, chapter 14 is utterly fascinating because God unveils the root and purpose of these ritual purification procedures. Chapter 14 lists the procedures by which a metzora becomes clean and then after additional rituals he or she again becomes acceptable to Jehovah. That is this person is more or less re-sanctified, re-holified. But chapter 14 also talks about another type of Zerat, a type of Zerat that appears on a house. So for the sake of making our study a little bit more cohesive, we're going to divide Leviticus 14 into two sections, verses 1 through 32. That deals with the purification rituals of a mitzora. And then verse 33 through 35, which introduces us to this final type of Zerat discussed in Leviticus that could infect a house. Now notice that after we get to that section, the matter of Zerat on a house only takes effect after Israel finally enters the promised land, Canaan. And that is at least partially because the house in question has to be a stone or a mud brick house. So this law had nothing to do with tents of these wandering Israelites. So let's read Leviticus chapter 14 and we're going to read the first 32 verses. That'll begin on page 124 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Adonai said to Moses, this is to be the law concerning the person afflicted with Zarat on the day of his purification. He's to be brought to the Kohen, the priest, and the uh, Kohen is to go outside the camp and examine him there. If he sees that the Zarat sores have been healed in the afflicted person, then the priest will order that two li living clean birds be taken for the one to be purified along with cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop leaves. The Kohen is to order one of the birds slaughtered in a clay plot, pot over running water. As for the live bird, he is to take it with the cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird slaughtered over the running water and sprinkle the person to be purified from the Zarat seven times. Next, he is to set the live bird free into an open field and he who is to be purified must wash his clothes, shave off all of his hair, bathe himself in water, then he'll be clean. And after that, he may enter the camp. But he must live outside his tent for seven days. 
Now on the seventh day, he's to shave off all the hair from his head, also his beard and his eyebrows. He must shave off all of his hair. And he is to wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he'll be clean. On the eighth day, he is to take two male lambs without defect, one female lamb in its first year without defect, and six and a half quarts of fine flour for the grain offering mixed with olive oil and two-thirds of a pint of olive oil. The priest purifying him is to place the person being purified with these items before Adonai at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering with the two-thirds pint of olive oil, and then wave them as a wave offering before Adonai. He is to slaughter the male lamb at the place in the sanctuary for slaughtering sin offerings and bird offerings because the guilt offering belongs to the priests, just like the sin offering. It is especially holy. The Kohen is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the right tip of the right ear of the person being purified, on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot. Next, the Kohen is to take some of the, uh, of the two-thirds pint of olive oil, pour it onto the palm of his own left hand, dip his right finger into the oil that is in his left hand, and then sprinkle from the oil with his finger seven times before Adonai. Then the priest is to put some of the remaining oil in his hand on the tip of the right ear of the person being purified, on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot, and on the blood of the guilt offering. Finally, the priest is to put the rest of the oil in his hand on the head of the person that's being purified, and the priest will make atonement for him before Adonai. The priest is to offer the sin offering and make atonement for the person being purified because of his uncleanness. Afterwards, he's to slaughter the burnt offering. The priest is to offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus, the priest will make atonement for him, and he will be clean. Now, if he's poor so that he can't afford to do otherwise, he's to take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him. Two quarts of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering, two-thirds of a pint of olive oil, two doves or two young pigeons, which such as he can afford, the one for sin offering, the other for bird offering, and on the eighth day he'll bring them to the Kohen for his purification to the entrance to the tent of meeting before Adonai. The Kohen is to take the lamb of the guilt offering and the two-thirds of a pint of olive oil and wave them as a wave offering before Adonai. He's to slaughter the lamb of the guilt offering, and the Kohen is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering, put it on the tip of the right ear of the person being purified, on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The Kohen is to take some of the olive oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand, sprinkle it with his right hand, some of the oil that's in his left hand, seven times before Adonai. The priest is to put some of the oil in his hand on the tip of the right ear of the person being purified, on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot, in the same place as the blood of the guilt offering. Finally, the Kohen is to put the rest of the oil in his hand on the head of the person being purified to make atonement for him before Adonai. He is to offer one of the doves or young pigeons, such as the person can afford whatever his means suffice for it. The one is a sin offering, the other is a burnt offering with the grain offering. Thus the Kohen will make atonement before Adonai for the person being purified. Such is the law for the person who has Zarat stores if he can't afford the usual elements used for his purification. Okay. The first thing to notice is pretty obvious. The ritual procedures for cleansing a Matsura from his uncleanness are among the most demanding and complex rites in all of Leviticus. They are some humdingers. Now, what might not be so obvious, though, is that they are very similar to those rituals we studied back in chapter 8, rituals that consecrated a priest into the priesthood. This is not a coincidence. Perhaps there is no more sober matter in these various prescribed Levitical rituals than for someone who is about to take his place among God's set-apart servants, a priest. But running a very close second was this very serious issue of somebody becoming ritually unclean and the high price that had to be paid to become clean again. So let's look closely at these rites because they are a shadow and a type. A precise pattern appears, actually, that Yeshua would bring to fulfillment 
13 centuries later. Now the stage is set for our study in the first three verses of chapter 14. The Masora who was living outside the camp, away from his family, separated from his society and God, believes he's now well. But he can't make that judgment for himself. A priest has to be called to come and examine him or her. And the priest now, of course, has to venture where? Outside the camp where this victim is to look him over. If that priest determines that the Zarat is gone and the ritual procedures to make the Metzora, they begin now. A couple comments here. First, be aware that the priest did not ever attempt to cure the person. There's nothing to indicate that the priest even prayed over a mitzvah or offered any kind of comfort to them whatsoever. Why? Because this was not a typical disease like a, a cold virus or the flu or the measles. Things which the Israelite community commonly suffered just like we all do. This was a spiritual disease. There was no cure other than for Yehovah releasing that Matsura from his or her affliction. The priest wasn't asked to determine what the offense was that this person had committed against God to contract Zarat in the first place. He was only asked to determine if that person indeed had Zarat and then later if that person no longer had it. That was the priest's job. So after declaring the person unclean with Zarat, the only thing a priest could follow up with was to be able to declare that person clean again if that ever happened to be. Now second of all, notice that in addition to his inspecting the Metzora, the, the first purification rituals that the priest did took place outside the camp. Now, what this tells us is that just because the person's skin condition kind of cleared up, he wasn't automatically deemed as clean. He was simply eligible to become clean. So the priest had to first go to where the Mitsura was living and to conduct to look him all over to see if he was going to conduct those procedures on his behalf. This is not unlike the red heifer sacrifice that also had to take place where? Outside the camp. Therefore, it was outside the camp that the red heifer ritual was performed by the high priest. A ritual which resulted in a mixture of ashes from the red heifer and water which was then used to sprinkle upon those who needed cleansing from having touched a dead body. In fact there are even more similarities between the red heifer ritual and the run ones described in verses 4 through 7 for purifying someone from Zarat. The ritual for cleansing the Matsora begins by having two birds brought to a priest. Two birds of a, of a clean variety, of course. And along with the birds came cedar wood, scarlet from a, 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 a worm, and a hyssop branch. The scarlet from a worm is talking about a dye, type of dye, a red dye, produced in Bible times from eggs of a certain type of, of a worm that lived up in trees. A hyssop branch was invariably used in all kinds of Israelite purification ceremonies uh, talked about in Leviticus. And when we read in later studies about the red heifer sacrifice, you're going to see that these same items were involved. Cedar wood, red dye, hyssop. The procedure for purifying a metzora is that one of the birds is to be killed. Blood drained into a clay bowl. The bloods to then have water put into it. Next, the remaining live bird along with the bird along with the cedar wood and the hyssop and the red dye, they're all dipped into this, this mixture of blood and water in a bowl. 
Then the attending priest sprinkles the blood and water onto the Mitzorah seven times, and then the live bird is released to fly away. So let's take a look at this ritual. First of all, the clean birds had to be a type that were not for domestic use, and therefore when they were released, they wouldn't come back. So they did not use like pigeons. They didn't use doves that had homing instincts. Usually the birds used for the procedure were sparrows. Second, an interesting term in the original Hebrew is used to describe the water that is to be placed into this clay bowl into which the sparrow's blood is to be drained. It's called mayim chayim. And you might be a little bit surprised to hear what it means because you've heard it many times before. It means living water. That's right. Living water. I'll bet you thought the living water reference to Jesus was a New Testament idea. How about that? In fact, living water, meaning water taken not from a well or from a pond, but from a running spring or a river that flows, living water is a requirement for the water used in many of the Levitical sacrifices, particularly the ones involving uncleanness. So, when Yeshua described himself as the ultimate source of living water, it was instantly understood by the Jews of his day. Rivers could dry up, artisan springs could quit flowing, and then what, ha uh, then what happened was it was necessary to go find a new source for this living water. Yeshua was saying he was the real source of purification, and his source never dried up. The source was unlimited. So here we have yet another New Testament idea that a course begins in the Torah. Third, the scarlet or red dye that was dipped up into the bowl was actually in the form of a strip of wool that had been dyed red. Now finally, even though an animal, in this case of a, a, a bird, is killed for this purification rite, it's technically not a sacrifice. That is, it does not fall within the category of one of the named sacrificial rituals. It is simply a matter that the bird is slain by cutting its neck because the blood's needed. That is not the required procedure when you sacrifice a bird. Because when a bird is used as a sacrifice, you don't cut its neck. You pinch it in a precise way using your fingernail to sever its brain stem and kill it. You do not cut its neck. So, plus all of the sacrificial rituals are to take place where? The temple. For now, the tabernacle. They're out in the wilderness. And the killing of this bird was done far away from those holy grounds. And by the way, before one of you starts thinking about the red heifer sacrifice, a true sacrifice, which, which was done also outside the camp. It was connected to the tabernacle because the high priest who was slaughtering the red heifer worked in concert simultaneously with other priests who were located at the temple. The priest who, who killed this bird worked by himself. Now I point this out because in previous lessons I mentioned that there were required steps in uh, the Torah to go from unclean to holy. First one had to go from unclean to clean. Then one was finally eligible to go from clean to holy. Strictly speaking, no unclean person could even participate. And the only means that there is to make a person holy which was a sacrificial ritual involving blood. Only clean people are eligible to offer a blood sacrifice. It was living water that was the primary medium required to make an unclean person or unclean thing 
clean. On the other hand, it was blood that was required to make a clean thing, clean person, holy. So, a set of procedures that were not considered blood sacrifices first had to be performed to take the unclean person out of their defiled state back to this like neutral, neutral ground. Now, let me demonstrate to you another good example of how we should always be searching for patterns as the answer to why certain things are as they are when we study the Bible. Since the Torah pattern is that water purification makes the unclean person clean and sacrificial blood makes the clean person holy, and because Jesus Christ is said to be the one who fulfilled all the requirements of the sacrificial system, can we actually make a solid connection between the two above something that's not just allegory? A few weeks ago I told you that just as in the Old Testament times, unclean people today, today, must first become clean before they can be made holy. That although the process is instantaneous and invisible, so we don't really realize what's happened, when we accept Yeshua as our Savior, we move from being unclean in God's sight to clean, and then from clean to holy. So the spiritual principle we just have learned in Leviticus still holds true even with the advent of Jesus Christ. Listen to a New Testament passage that we're all familiar with. But it ought to mean something a little different to you now that you've been studying the Torah. In John 19.34 it says this, But one of the soldiers pierced his side, Jesus Christ, with a spear. And immediately there came out blood and water. And he who is seen has borne witness. And his witness is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you can believe. Blood and water poured out of him. Yep, it was so startling that the chronicler of this event acknowledges he was an eyewitness and even though it seems unimaginable, it was true. It just doesn't make any sense, though. What's the significance of the water that poured out of Christ's body? See, that water that poured out of him from that spear wound surprised people. This wasn't something that anybody had seen. There was no way in a nat as, that as a natural part of the cru uh, crucifixion process you should have had water coming out, which is why the author went to such great length to talk about it. The water had great meaning because Yeshua declared that he was the source of living water. The specific kind of water the Torah calls for in the purification from uncleanness. This matter about Christ and water and purification was prophesied. It was explained beforehand by Zechariah. Zechariah. Listen to this verse from one of the great biblical prophecies about the coming Messiah. Zechariah 13.1 In that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for their sin and for their uncleanness. And a few verses later it says the Messiah will be pierced. This passage is speaking about the coming of Yeshua. It's speaking about his crucifixion. Now a fountain, by definition, produces living water. A fountain is the source of moving water as opposed to a well that just holds water but doesn't move. Water from a fountain used for uncleanness is simply referring to the standard purification procedures. But even more, where our Bible say that in that verse, for sin and for uncleanness, the original Hebrew says, 
for hataat and for nida. Now that you studied Leviticus, you know that hataat doesn't mean sin offering. Hataat is the name of the purification offering. And nida is the Hebrew word for the spiritual state of uncleanness, usually associated with a woman on her period or after childbirth. But also meaning, it can mean just a general state of ritual impurity. So what this passage is getting at is that Yeshua is the fountain of living water for the purification offering the hatat and for those who are in a state of uncleanness nida remember uncleanness can be caused by sin or it can simply be a state declared by God where sin isn't even involved such as a mother after giving childbirth now if we would only bother to read Moses as Jesus said we ought to and take the Old Testament seriously, we would know that Yeshua would have to have provided both blood and water in order for mankind to be made holy. Water to take the unclean and make them clean. Blood as his atoning sacrifice. This was simply the playing out of the God-ordained Leviticus pattern. And of course the prophecies concerning him and his ministry on earth brought all this into play. It explained it ahead of time. In verse 7, the priest, upon sprinkling them at Sora seven times with the water and the, the, the uh, bird blood mixture, now declares the Metzora is clean. Next, the second bird is released into the air to fly away. Although we've not studied the scapegoat ritual yet, we will. This idea of taking a pair of animals, killing one of them, and then releasing the other one, this is the same for the scapegoat procedure. The concept is that the live animal, in this case it's a bird, bears the person's iniquity and then it's sent far away from that person. Or in the case of the scapegoat, the sins of an entire nation are laid upon that goat and then it's sent away. Now I point this out because it's difficult to understate the tremendous importance placed on returning one who has contracted Zarat back to a state of cleanness. The ritual involves identical elements of two of the sacrifices over which only the high priest can preside. The red heifer sacrifice and the scapegoat ritual. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, the ritual to cleanse a Mitzora is very similar to a priest being consecrated into the priesthood. Well, after the bird has been released, the Mitzora must now wash his garments, and he has to shave his head, bathe himself. One of the, once the Israelites were settled in Canaan, the place of a ritual bath became a mikveh, kind of a stone swimming pool. You see the mermaid in this one here. <laughs> and as we've discussed, the concept of clean and unclean is very complex. It's not simple. You will notice that several times after a certain part of the ritual procedure we're studying, Scripture will say that the person's now pure. It, it, says, after, it says that after verse 7, then after verse 8, then again after verse 9, and it's going to say it several more times in chapter 14. And it gets a little bit confusing. Here, as with the new mother procedure, we're, what we're actually seeing is the Mitzora, Mitzora gaining greater and greater and greater levels of his purity or her purity back in stages. It doesn't just take one big leap. In verse 7, he reaches the first stage. In verse 8, after shaving and bathing, he moves up to the next stage. In the second page, stage of purity, he's even allowed back into the camp of Israel. But he can't enter his house or his tent for another seven days. Verse 9, the third stage of purity is reached. Because then 
upon shaving off all of his hair yet again, including his beard, his eyebrows. Man, what a strange looking dude that must have been. And then again washing himself and his clothes in water. He's got that third stage. Finally, he's clean enough. He's reached a stage of ritual purity that's now sufficient for him to participate in the sacrificial rituals, which means he can go to the temple. What we see in one sense is a gradual re-socialization of this person who was an outcast. Step by step, this person is taken from being this outcast and he's brought back to become a member again of Israelite society. And in the same way, step by step, this person is brought back from being shunned by Yehovah back into his favor, back into his holy presence. The physical and the spiritual elements of restoration are completely linked in lockstep as we go along here. Now on the eighth day after that first step towards becoming clean, then holy, the sacrificial procedures for the Mitzora begin. And here we have another link we should not overlook. There's another very important Jewish procedure that takes place on the eighth day. What is that? That's right, circumcision. See, in God's eyes and in Hebrew thinking, an unclean person is spiritually dead. The purification of a person from his uncleanness has many aspects of resurrection from the dead involved. Quite literally, the purification process breathes new breath, new life into a spiritually dead person. So what has that got to do with circumcision? The male child is not an official member of Israel until he's circumcised. For all practical purposes until circumcised, that male child is outside the camp of Israel. This is because the Abrahamic covenant from which came the Hebrew people and God's promises uh, about making the Hebrews a multitude that gave them a special land required as a sign of joining into that covenant male circumcision. This was reaffirmed with the Mosaic covenant and it was non-negotiable. On the eighth day after life was given to this baby boy he was offered into the camp, he was rather accepted into the camp of Israel during a circumcision ceremony. And on the eighth day after new life was given back to the Metzora, better life was refer returned to him, he was accepted back into the camp of Israel. See the connection? Outside the camp is death, inside the camp is life. Outside of a relationship with God is death, inside a relationship with God is life. You see the pattern created. The evangelical concept of born again did not originate in the New Testament because the Metzora was quite literally called born again. When he was purified, when he was reintroduced into Israelite society and his relationship with Yehovah was reestablished. So the New Testament born-again concept is just repeating an Old Testament pattern. In fact, not only did born-again originate in the Old Testament, so did the idea of circumcision of the heart begin in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And circumcision of the heart, a phrase that Paul liked to use, was first stated by Moses in Deuteronomy 10.16. And its purpose was to point out the exact same thing Paul was pointing out, that true circumcision, which brings entry into the camp of Israel, and thereby into relationship with the God of Israel, was a spiritual matter, far more than it was a physical matter. And we're going to look at that more closely when we get to Deuteronomy. Verse 10 prescribes these two lambs, plus a single-year-old lamb, some grain mixed with oil, plus a flask with some additional oil. Oil, of course, means olive oil. You see the word oil in the Bible? It's not what you drill for. It means olive oil. 
The Hebrew describing the oil says it's to be a log of oil. This isn't to a reference of, of, of the type of container. It wasn't put into a log. It's a measurement. It's about a pint. Now, in the following verse, we see that there were several types of sacrifices that had to be performed for this mitzorah. The Ola, the Mincha, the Hata'at, and the Asham. That is, the bird offering, the grain or the meal offering that accompanied it, the purification offering, and the reparation offering. The only typical sacrifice that is available to a non-priest to offer that is not prescribed for this Mitzora ritual is the peace offering, the Zeva, Zeva Shlamim to be precise. Again, this points out the enormously seri serious nature, the big price that has to be paid for a person who is unclean from Zarat. In other words, a terrible spiritual inner, uh, terrible inner spiritual condition that God sees in us to become clean. Big price had to be paid. The priest was to accompany the person being purified and reconsecrate it to the entrance. He would usher him up to the wilderness tabernacle, the temple, not actually inside the courtyard, but just, to, just up to the main entry gate. Now, it could get a little confusing as to where exactly something was a, to take place around the sanctuary because usually the entire tabernacle area, courtyard, sanctuary tent is simply referred to in shorthand in the scriptures as the tent of meeting. So, um, oh, got out of sequence here. Um, In our current case, where most Bibles say the person was to stand at the entrance to the tent of meeting, it doesn't mean to stand at the door to the holy place, that is, into the sanctuary tent, just at the, the gate. The Metzora would then face towards the sanctuary, consisting of the holy place, the holy of holies. The priest would go forward with the uh, uh, korbanos, that is, sev the several sacrifices official offerings brought by the Mitzorah. The Mitzorah then had to stand at the entrance to the courtyard and wait while the priest went through all these rituals. First, the priest offered the Asham, or the reparation offering. It was done in the form of a wave offering. It was held up. It was went a back and forth motion before God. In Hebrew, this wave offering is called Tenfa. And the priest holds the lamb and the log of oil together, shoulder high, moves it around, up and down. And briefly the idea of the Asham offering for reparation is unusual for what amounts to a purification procedure. Because the Asham is normally meant to atone for trespassing against holy property. Or maybe swearing a false oath. Or as I pointed out, on several occasions as one of the offerings just for a suspected trespass. You don't even know what you've done. Now since the since Zarat is considered to be a spiritual disease and therefore a punishment from God, we can rather easily see why Amit Sora would offer an Asham sacrifice because he must have trespassed against God or he wouldn't have Zarat. But just so we don't get the wrong idea, Whereas an Asham and a Zeva could be voluntary sacrifices, here it was required. So God certainly sees the need for it. What exactly was the trespass <laughs> the menorah had committed, uh, rather the Mitzorah had committed? Well, most of the ancient Jewish sages agree that most likely sin, the actual sin that caused it was something called Lashon Hara, slander, evil speech against somebody. What we might call character assassination. It's a very grievous sin akin to murder. And although it doesn't tell us here in Leviticus, the Mishnah tells us the procedure was that the Asham lamb was then brought back to the Mitzora. The Mitzora laid hands on the head of this live lamb. Remember now that's called Semaka. And then the laying of on the hands of the sacrificial animal signified two things. 
One, that the worshiper is identifying this particular animal as the one he's offering. And two, the guilt of the worshiper is transferred onto the animal. And the animal becomes a substitute. Next, the lamb is taken back to the altar area, specifically on the north side of the altar. And he's slaughtered there. Some of the blood splashed on the altar. Some of it's dabbed on the right ear, the right thumb, the right big toe of the Mitzorah. Following that, some of the olive oil is sprinkled in the direction of the Holy of Holies. Then from that oil, the priest is to dab oil on the Mitzorahs in exactly the same place he had just finished dabbing the lamb's blood. It's important to notice that this is the same procedure that we saw back in chapter 8 for consecrating a priest into a priesthood. The idea of dabbing blood and oil on the ear, thumb, and toe was that the cleansing and the consecration was from head to toe. The whole person was now pure. The Metzora, he's still standing at the entrance to the tabernacle courtyard. He now has oil applied to the crown of his head. Following that, the female lamb for the Hata'at offering and the male lamb for the Olah offering were slaughtered. While the first offering uh, performed, the Asham was offered entirely by the priest because the Matsura wasn't pure enough yet to be a participant in any sacrificial ritual. The Matsura was now allowed at this point in the procedure to go beyond the gate of the courtyard and he could take his rightful role in the Hata'at, Ola, and Minker sacrifices. This was a very significant step. Again, notice that there are these steps, these levels of purity that had to be attained. Starting off unclean outside the camp, it took until the second level before Masora could set foot inside the camp. The third level before he was considered clean and eligible to even be present for temple sacrifices, and then an even higher level before he could pass the gate of the tabernacle and actually participate as normal in a ritual sacrifice. From verses 21 through 32, we see that birds can be substituted for some of the lambs of the Mitzvah as a poor person. Likely this was the case more often than not because the normally lengthy time that an afflicted person had been forced to live outside the camp made him unable to tend his flocks, made him into a poor person sometimes. But he cannot under any circumstance escape the need for a lamb for the initial offering, the asham. We're not going to go into over these verses because other than the, for the substitution of birds for lambs, the ritual is exactly the same. After this person now is no longer a mitzorah, no longer a person unclean from Sarat, he or she is fully reintegrated into society. Most important, that person's relationship with God is now reestablished. He's finally, once again, after a very long time, at peace with God and declared holy once again. Can you imagine that person's relief? I mean, what an ordeal they had gone through. Now, quick comment we'll move on religious Jews often refer to Christianity as a cheap religion now, I'm not going to go deeply into all the reasons some of them are frankly unfair and, and false but perhaps you're starting to see some of this for yourselves Jews scoff at the idea that we pray a few pretty words and receive Christ and in an instant we are purified and made clean brought inside the camp, joined to their covenants and have our sins all atoned for bada bing, bada boom, from unclean to saved just like that, what a deal the cost to us, nothing how can that be we don't give up anything we don't pay anything, at least on the surface we only give up our sin and its destiny. Look at what it tangibly cost a Hebrew to maintain his relationship with God year after year. 
Look at what it cost in time and money to be taken from unclean to clean, then to holy. All these sacrifices that we've just looked at were costly. Many had to be repeated on a regular basis. Indeed, it often cost a Hebrew almost everything he had to participate in his required sacrificial rituals. If he didn't, his relationship with God was either lost or damaged. But in general, they did it. Because they saw peace with God as the number one priority in their lives. Without that peace with Jehovah, what hope was there in life anyway? So from a Jewish standpoint, it's not very hard to see why many see our Christian faith as cheap, meaning without cost. And as it pertains to us, the receivers of what God did for us, they're right. Our cost is pretty much zero. But God and His Son Yeshua gave up everything. A cost far beyond the richest man on earth's ability to even pay. Sometimes Christians walk around kind of proud about this and we accuse the Jews of trying to work their way to heaven. We shouldn't. Rather, we ought to walk around kind of humble, beyond imagination, I think. We should also be a little bit more understanding of why a Jew would see Christianity as a cheap religion. And hopefully after our study in Leviticus, maybe now we're in a better place to converse with a Jewish person about this, since we can better see where they're coming from, what they mean by that. Now let's move forward with the second half of Leviticus 14 contained in verses 33 to 53, and this matter concerns Zarat on houses. Now this section is interesting. If for no other reason, it anticipates that future time when a mob of about three million Hebrews is going to live in their own cities with permanent housing. Now let's pause for a few minutes to end this lesson and regain some perspective about all this. Remember that here in Leviticus, we're at a time a little more than a year after the exodus from Egypt. That's all. With all the studying we've done to this point, it's pretty easy to forget that barely a year has passed since that very first Passover in Egypt. So all of this would have been pretty fresh in their minds. I wonder how real the possibility of the future that God had just promised to them was to them at that moment. Here they are in the midst of these unbelievably bad living conditions, a time which would soon get all extended a lot farther than they'd ever hoped for. Could they have faith that would actually believe they were going to have a land of their own just because some God said so. That they would actually live in a place flowing with milk and honey while they're out there wandering around in the desert scraping up water. That they would actually eventually shed their temporary tents. They'd live in cities again with roads and water wells and cultivated fields and houses. In fact, Everything in Leviticus, as with all the Torah, is a preparation for a future time, even though it was also for the present. It is still so with us today. Even though Yeshua HaMashiach has brought much of the Torah into fruition, a lot still remains to be taken to a higher level of meaning and reality. The prophets, including Jesus, tells us about a future, a time that's still future to us in which a lot of things are yet to happen. Some of them wonderful, some of them horribly calamitous. Do we have the faith to believe that these things are actually going to happen? 
Will we be faithful in the midst of these things and recognize them for what they are? God's judgments. So easy for us to look back in hindsight at this rebellious and stiff-necked nation of Israel and find fault with them for all of their grumbling, all of their stumbling, all their dissatisfaction, thinking, oh my gosh, what more does God have to do to prove his power and love and trustworthiness to them? I mean, my goodness, he destroyed Egypt to free them. He killed hundreds of thousands of Egyptians, but he spared Israel. He gave Israel his divine Torah. He set them apart as his own people. He rained food from the sky every day so they wouldn't be hungry. He sprang water from rocks when there was nowhere else to get it. He traveled with them in a visible way in a pillar of fire and cloud. Are we really any different? As the people of God who now actually have God dwelling in us, if we actually believed and we actually trusted that we are guaranteed in a fu eternal future with God Almighty, if we actually believed and trusted that our sufferings here on earth are going to serve a greater purpose for the kingdom of God, if we actually believed and trusted that the days just around the corner that our Messiah is going to return, would we actually still live our lives the way we typically do? Now, I only say these things to put into perspective that these Israelites we continue to read about, we're no different than we are. They're just people a set-apart people elected to serve God, just like us. But also like us, they struggled to put the promises of God and His laws and His commandments and His principles into daily practice. And when they were told of a glorious future, it brought hope at times, but it was also, also hazy also theoretical and far away, difficult to reach out and grasp, lay hold of it. They lived in the now, not in the future. Sometimes just getting through today can be pretty tough to deal with. Further, they were faced with constant reapplication of God's spiritual principles, just as we are. Sometimes we think that the only major transition for Israel as it concerns having to reapply God's principles was from the Old Testament to the New. From the time before Christ to the time after His coming. But that's not so. We see them here in Leviticus being transformed from a time living in Egypt as slaves to a time of wandering. From a time of slavery to a time of freedom. From a time of servitude to Pharaoh to a time of service to Jehovah. And then a little later from a time of wandering to a time of possessing a land. Eventually, they would transition from a tabernacle, which was just a big tent, to a temple. They would struggle with taking God's laws and commandments from the situation and time they were originally presented to them in at Mount Sinai only a year after leaving Egypt and then applying those laws and commandments to new circumstances that weren't precisely addressed in the rather limited instructions given to them through Moses. Yet they were fully expected by God to do exactly that, just as we are. They were fully expected to maintain the purpose of every spiritual principle God gave to them, just like we are. Yeah, it's a hard struggle. We're going to find over and over again in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that the leaders of Israel tried to abrogate, to change, to dismiss, and even to rebel against God's spiritual principles because they weren't easy. Saying that these principles were from a long time ago didn't apply to them anymore. And the consequences for the leadership and for their people and the nation of Israel as a whole was terrible. We're faced with the same responsibility as people of God. We're not 
to reinterpret God's word for our time. We're to reapply it to our current situation. Our immediate circumstances will always be in flux. But God's principles are always stable. It was true for Israel. It's true for us. It's true for everybody who's going to come after us. Next week we'll finish up Leviticus chapter 14. Father God, I know this is a hard lesson for us to take. Because Father, it once again says that faith without works is dead. That we can't just walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and then figure we can go into retirement. There is a lot to learn. There's a lot to do. And you expect it of us. You have expectations of your people. We're not tag-alongs. We're who you depend on to take your word to others and to expand your kingdom here on earth. Father, if during our lives we've maybe shunned this and not fulfilled it, I pray that you would turn us and that we would grab hold of all that you want. For Father, the joy that it brings when we're in your will is so marvelous. I pray that as we go out this week, we will determine to live our lives in harmony with you, to get out of our comfort level, to adjust to whatever it is that you say you've equipped us to do even if we don't feel like it, and then move forward. We love you, Lord. Now let us use those words for something more than a bumper sticker. We praise your holy name in this place, Lord. Let it be the motto of our lives. Amen. See you next time.